All right, good afternoon. I am Kaisa George. I am a voluntary agency liaison here at headquarters. Welcome to our voluntary organization, Information Sharing and Engagement, uh, otherwise known as the Voice Partner Call. This call is going to be in a webinar format focused on safety and security measures that private nonprofit and faith-based organizations can take during spring religious observances. Now, this is a really, really important uh, subject that affects us all. Um, I want to remind folks that if you have any questions, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box. Uh, we will work to address them during the call. And if not during, uh, then we will gather them and address them after the call. I want to thank our ASL interpreters, our closed captioners, and to the bot for your support today. For those needing ASL assistance, please press the interpretation button that looks like a, it's a little button at the bottom of your screen to enable the ASL. Um, this call is also being closed captioned and recorded. So now, due to our packed agenda, I am going to be your timekeeper for today, and I am excited to introduce the facilitator for today's call. Nicole Wood, she's the Deputy Director for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, which is a DHS center of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. In her current role, she is a liaison and convener on DHS-related issues impacting faith-based and community-based organizations, as well as protecting the safety and security of places of worship. Nicole provides training and technical assistance for meeting the needs of survivors of both natural and human-caused disasters, as well as human trafficking, both domestically and international. Now, prior to her federal service, Nicole served at World Relief and World Hope International, leading anti-human trafficking efforts for the faith community. She was also as a presidential management fellow with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and served on Capitol Hill with former civil rights leader, the late Congressman John Lewis. And it is my honor to introduce um, Nicole Wood. Uh, Nicole, the floor is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Kaiser, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. We are certainly grateful uh, to have you join us for an exciting hour and a half of a really packed full agenda. So again, I want to welcome you to the Voice Partner Call, the Spring Religious Observance Safety and Security Briefing. As shared, my name is Nicole Wood. And I do have the good privilege of serving as a deputy director within the Department of Homeland Security Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And today we have the good pleasure to hear from um, our senior leaders on this important topic. Uh, we will be able to provide you um, some of our nonprofits and people of faith, a briefing from the Department of Homeland Security's Intelligence and Analysis, as well as to get a sense of the landscape review or resources to promote safety and security for places of worship. Uh, we know that national and faith and community and federal partners will have an opportunity to hear from them to have to discuss recommendations on resources and relationships and recovery efforts that will help mitigate against acts of terrorism and targeted violence. And as we all know, we want to keep safe and have secure places of worship for all, in particular, during the spring religious observances. To kick off our time together, um, let's first just kind of review what we'll be doing today and our agenda uh, to give you a sense of what is to be expected. Next slide. And so first, we will hear um, from our senior leadership. Uh, we will hear from the White House, uh, Melissa Rogers, as well as Reverend Thomas Bowen. We'll have colleagues uh, from the Department of Homeland Security, Rebecca Kagan Sternhill, as well as from the Department of Justice, Sim Singh Atariwala. Uh, we will have then our Spring Religious Observance Threat Briefings from Bailey McMillan. And then you'll hear um, a panel discussion giving some real practical steps uh, that you hope that will help you in your places of worship and our community spaces. Um, so we will have an exciting panel, as you'll note there. Uh, we will also hear uh, several federal and nonprofit resources um, within FEMA and American Red Cross, as well as the 
Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, as well as the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And then, of course, we will also hear uh, from our colleagues within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. As noted, a fun and exciting uh, time together, and certainly want to kick it off first with my leadership, someone whom I've had the good pro privilege of working alongside for several administrations, um, certainly had the good privilege to work under her leadership. So it first gives me great privilege to welcome uh, Melissa Rogers. She serves as the Special Assistant to the President and the Executive Director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Thank you so, Melissa, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's great to be with you. I hope my sound is okay for everyone. And I want to thank all of the wonderful partners that we have with us here on the call. Uh, and I want to say a word of thanks to each of you from President Biden uh, for the leadership you provide in the community, for the many ways in which you strengthen our country. We are grateful for you, and we are so grateful to have this opportunity to talk today. As you know, we're sadly facing an increase in targeted violence and hate, one that has tragically taken so many precious lives, wounded many others, and traumatized many communities, including numerous faith communities. We're here today to talk about how we can work together to keep places of worship and other faith-based communities safe, as Nicole said. And the president has made this his commitment here very clear. He has said, for example, that he is determined to ensure that no one feels afraid to attend a religious service, a school or community center, or simply walk down the street wearing the symbols of their faith. This, as we all know, is a bedrock principle of our nation's commitment to religious freedom. Now, to meet these challenges, the Biden-Harris administration is taking an array of actions. For example, President Biden signed and the administration is implementing laws such as the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, and the Jabara Hire No Hate Act, laws that I know so many of you worked so hard to pass. Thank you. The administration is also taking executive actions to reduce gun violence, to prioritize efforts to combat hate crimes, including crimes that are committed on the basis of religious identity or affiliation. We're also implementing the National Strategy for Countering Domestic uh, Terrorism and the National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism, while we develop a national strategy to counter Islamophobia and related forms of bias and discrimination including bias and discrimination directed at Arab, Sikh, and South Asian Americans. Working with Congress, the Biden-Harris administration secured the greatest increase in funding in our history for the physical security of nonprofits, including churches, gurdwaras, mosques, synagogues, temples, and other places of worship. With your help, we've created a toolkit for faith communities on standing together against hate, which we'll be happy to share with you. And let me just add that seeing the solidarity across faith communities against hate, it continues to inspire all of us. We've also launched other new initiatives, such as the Protecting Places of Worship Week of Action. These efforts are ones where we're not only endeavoring to provide resources to faith communities, but we're also asking how we can work together more effectively. We're asking for your comments and your suggestions and also asking you to share information with one another, which does so much to help us improve our security as well. So today we're, we're continuing this work through our webinar. You'll hear about steps that houses of worship and other faith-based organizations can take to increase security while sustaining an open and welcoming environment. And as we've already said, there'll be opportunities for questions and comments. And of course, all this work requires building partnerships and strengthening partnerships with you. Partnerships always have to be two-way streets where we listen to you and where we can widen and strengthen our collaboration. Moving forward, we would like to work even more closely with you in the days ahead to keep everyone safe. So thanks again for your leadership and being here today. And thanks to all of you who are uh, joining us from the administration to offer your expertise and also for your hard work. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, the Reverend Thomas Bowen. So many of you know him already, um, but what you may not know is that he is now working here at the White House. And we're really thrilled about that. Reverend Bowen previously served as director 
to Mayor Bowser's Office of Religious Affairs, and he now serves as a senior advisor to the White House Office of Public Engagement. So, Reverend Bowen, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for your enthusiasm and for your leadership. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here today representing the White House Office of Public Engagement. On behalf of the administration, I extend warm greetings and gratitude to FEMA and DHS Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships for organizing this crucial Spring Religious Observing Safety and Security Briefing. Our commitment to ensuring the safety and security of all communities, especially during times of religious observance, remains unwavering. Your dedication to this important mission is commendable, and I look forward to collaborating with each of you in the spirit of Melissa Call's partnership and shared values. I believe that together we can foster a safer and more inclusive environment for all. Thank you. Back to you, Nicole. Well, thank you so much, Melissa Rogers, as well as Reverend Thomas Bowen. We are certainly grateful to you both for your leadership within the Biden-Harris administration and for outlining ways in which you are addressing this important topic to so many. So again, thank you for your time and welcome to Reverend Bowen in his new role. Uh, with that, allow us now to turn our attention over to a dear colleague of mine uh, within the Department of Homeland Security, Ms. Rebecca Kagan Sternhill. She serves as the Department of Homeland Security's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Partner and Engagement. Rebecca, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Nicole. And again, I want to echo the thanks uh, that uh, the Reverend and um, everyone has said for everyone here today with us. I wanted to briefly just highlight a few things going on here at the departmental level uh, that we work in close in collaboration with, with um, Melissa's office and with the neighbor, the DHS center headquartered over at FEMA. Um, in my role as PDAS, we, I, we oversee the NGO portfolio, which includes a lot of our faith-based work and includes our Faith-Based Security Advisory Council. I think many of you on the line are familiar with it. Uh, the council issued a number of recommendations this past summer uh, that we're diligently working to implement here at the department. I think you'll start to see some of those changes uh, when you see the nonprofit security grant program NOFOs roll out, and we're continuing to engage uh, to uh, reform and make ourselves more accessible, make our resources more available uh, to all of you out there. But I did want to just quickly highlight a few things we're working on now and the council is working on. In particular, they're working on transnational repression and how we might better, as a department, support faith communities in combating TNR uh, resources that faith communities might need. We've seen a lot of troubling reports um, of TNR here within the U.S. targeting individuals, especially with those who have defected from um, other countries, and so how we can do a better job to support you. We we'll also have the Faith Council focus on combating online child sexual abuse and exploitation. This is a, a huge and growing issue. Uh, the Secretary has tasked a number of his advisory councils to work on this issue, and we're leaning on our faith partners and our faith communities to help us combat this very, very pernicious issue. And third, and perhaps most relevant to today, um, one issue that they're also working on is, is fostering, promoting, bolstering community resilience, especially in the wake of disasters, um, attacks of violence, how we can help build that fabric between communities to ensure there's greater resilience there. And we as a department can help support those efforts uh, rather than get in the way uh, and, and be a hindrance, because at times we know it can be difficult uh, when the federal government steps in here. Uh, so within that, the department is also continuing to what we call our roadshow, where we're traveling the country, meeting with groups. There's a team in Salt Lake right now meeting with LDS. Uh, there's also a team will be heading out to Ohio and we'll be traveling throughout the country again, meeting with communities, meeting with faith groups, understanding the needs and challenges. And as Melissa highlighted, really trying to listen and understand because it is a two way street. Um, I did want to highlight one special thing coming up in Nashville on the 19th. Uh, we've heard from communities. These virtual forums are lovely for all of us, but getting everybody from a community in the room together uh, is important. And we can share resources that way in person in the room. And so we'll be kicking off this new series of engagements of trainings um, and resources in Nashville on the 19th. So we're very excited about this to actually be in a room as a community together again. Uh, so that I will let see a colleague thunder. I know there's a number of other resources out there uh, on the department's page and on the NGO page. You can find many of the wonderful resources our colleagues at CISA and FEMA put together. Uh, as we like to say, there's no wrong door here. Uh, our door is always open and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Back to you, Nicole. 
Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. And as Rebecca had just mentioned, um, they are certainly a key partner you want to know for engaging. So as she mentioned, there are opportunities to engage with this office across our nation. You want to let you know that they welcome opportunities to engage with your faith and our community group uh, in our nation. So just know that is a resource to each and every one of you. Uh, next, we want to invite um, that not just within DHS, we have incredible partners at the Department of Justice. I had the good pleasure to welcome a dear friend, uh, the director, Sim Singh Atariwala, for the DHS, excuse me, for the Department of Justice's Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. We are both one of 11 centers that serves the White House office. So again, Sim, so grateful to have you, and so we'll turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, Sim. Thank you, Nicole, for that warm welcome, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to join you today and express gratitude for your attendance today. Our center at the Department of Justice, in collaboration with our federal counterparts at the Department of Homeland Security, and in cooperation with the White House, work to enhance the safety and security of our nation's faith communities, especially during the spring religious observances. We also recognize the very real concerns that communities are facing due to tensions arising out of the conflict in Israel and Palestine. Hate against any community will not be accepted. Our collective mission highlighted today centers on safeguarding the sanctity of worship and assembly. In response to the rise in religious bias hate crimes, the Department of Justice has mobilized resources and expertise throughout the department. We've established crucial dialogues with faith leaders, offering strategies to protect houses of worship and information on navigating the complexities of hate crimes and provide funding to communities for hate crime prevention and response initiatives. We want to continue this important work with partners like you. Central to our mission is the unwavering commitment to balance safety with the preservation of civil liberties. The department treats civil rights crimes, which include hate crimes, as a national threat priority. Last year, we exceeded more than $38 million in grants to combat hate at the state and local level. And initiatives like the Jabara Heather Hire No Hate Act program specifically exemplify our push for more detailed, actionable hate crime data with federal reporting systems. Accurate comprehensive data collection is vital and requires coordination with community leaders like those in attendance at today's event, as well as state and local and tribal agencies. Over the past two years, the department has launched a program called United Against Hate, and all 94 U.S. attorneys offices have brought together community groups, community leaders, law enforcement at all levels to build trust and strengthen coordination to combat unlawful acts of hate and improve hate crime reporting. To date, these offices held over 300 events, bringing together more than 10,000 participants. Additionally, the Community Relations Service at the Department of Justice provides facilitation, mediation, training, and consultation services at no cost and does so in an impartial manner. CRS has several services that communities can take advantage of. One of the most frequently requested programs is the Protecting Places of Worship Forums that educates local communities on how to prevent and respond to hate crimes that target religious institutions, fosters dialogue to strengthen relations between government, law enforcement, and faith communities. There are also trainings for maintaining safety during public events that you may be hosting. Surprisingly, Federal partners like CRS are great first resources rather than being the resource of last resort. And for government partners in attendance on today's call, I would also encourage them to engage smaller places of worship that might not have a lot of safety and security expertise. Learn what barriers may exist for those smaller communities to assess a pathway to begin engagement that will be meaningful and sustainable. Government partners don't have to do this work on their own. CRS can help you get a better understanding of smaller faith communities and share best practices on building trust. As you've heard from other speakers today, partnerships stand at the heart of our strategy. Together, we confront bigotry and work towards dismantling the divisions that threaten our unity. The Department of Justice is committed to ensuring that every individual, regardless of their background or beliefs, lives free from fear. Nicole, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you so much, Sim, and thank you so much for the resources that you shared in the chat. We hope that others will take advantage of them, uh, recognizing there is so many things that you, you can notice that we are truly committed to protecting uh, places of worship, um, as noted by Sim, that they too have opportunities within the Department of Justice where you can get free and available uh, support as well. So again, 
please take advantage of what has been shared by our leaders. I want to welcome and to invite uh, some colleagues in both faith and community sectors. First, Stephanie Vegas. She serves as a Deputy National Security Advisor for Secure Community Network. We also have April Wood. She serves as the President and CEO of the National Voluntary Organization's Active Disaster. We have Cabinet Singh. He's the Active Executive Director for the Sikh American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And we have Chief Perry Tarrant. He's the Senior Advisor of Law Enforcement for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We'd like to invite them all to join us and we will drop the presentation so we have an opportunity to connect in a dialogue uh, for this discussion. Uh, with that, guys, as we want to kick up first our time, thank you all. Um, I know you're lending all of your expertise, and I know that people are probably exciting and wanting to know first more about you. Um, I know I would, uh, because I think you all are quite dynamic, and because of time, we were not able to do all of your introductions, but certainly uh, what does kick off for us to have a conversation around what are some, knowing that you are dynamic speakers, what are some ways in which um, faith leaders or government partners can work with your organization? So again, how can we start working with you and the good work that you are doing? So again, you might want to share again uh, your organization and ways that faith and or community partners and, and even government partners can work within your organization. Um, I will allow and open it up to anyone who wants to kick us off on how we can better work and connect with you. We'll go to April. Thanks, Nicola. I was about to jump in. Good afternoon. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. So at the National um, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, we are a membership coalition of disaster relief and recovery organizations across the U.S. We're comprised of about 130 organizations and represent millions of volunteers across the United States. About um, of that, about 75 are national organizations, and about half of those are faith-based organizations representing a diverse representation of houses of worship across the country. Organizations like Buddhist Suchi Foundation, Islamic Relief USA, Jew the Jewish Federations of North America, for example, um, and many other faith-based groups from the Catholics to the Methodists to the Baptists, of course, uh, make up our coalition of organizations. Our members... Um, have expertise in emotional and spiritual care, community preparedness activities, life-saving training in some cases, and particularly experience working with diverse communities as part of our values of being able to collaborate and coordinate and communicate and cooperate across the country. Um, so I would encourage you to get connected um, as part of our structure to our 56 state and territory and district of Columbia Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster at our state and territory VOAD level and our structure and to identify and connect with one of our organizations, you can visit www.nvoad.org. That's nvoad.org under our members tab and just start a conversation. This is about knowing your community and getting to know your community member and your community leaders um, across the country. So starting with those coalitions to engage them around conversations of safety and security and how everyone can work together to stay safe. Thank you, April. And as she noted, they are across our nation. And most states, I do believe, have a state um, VOAD. Um, again, that's Voluntary Organizations Act from Disasters. So there is a way to get connected at the lo local level. And of course, April is at the national level. So as she mentioned, please visit uh, their website to learn more. I'm going to jump over to our colleagues of Cabinet Singh. I'd love to hear from you. How can people get better engaged around the good work that you all are doing? Thank you so much, Nicole, and <clears throat> special thanks to Pamela and Sarah for the undoubtedly amazing work that they are doing um, around translating in ASL. So uh, the 30-second brief on me, Gavneet Singh, I'm here happily representing the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund, which is the nation's oldest Sikh civil rights and advocacy organization. So we have members, chapters, volunteers across the country advocating for um, the community and, and more broadly, I think, are all of our black and brown communities across the country. So uh, how I how I thought about this, I think, is DHS is in this unique position of <clears throat> having tremendous resources, but not really having access to the community and or connectivity to the community. So what are those barriers? Right. And I, I think it would be naive to think trust is not one of them. And so how do we work with DHS to build trust both from a community standpoint as well as an organizational standpoint. 
I think part of that's stemming from and the presentation we heard from before a really DHS taking data, understanding what is the community going through? How, and then taking that to say next, hey, how do we understand the community? How do we understand their challenges? And how can we partner to create solutions? And how can we actually be creative, understanding that everyone's in a budget and or um, resource constraint? Um, one of the biggest things that we've heard is around language access issues. So both access of language, to funding opportunities to programs of things not being in the language of an immigrant community um, and then not having that staff actually to be able to have that language to communicate out to these places of worship um, and these sacred spaces around in language that they would understand. I think that's a clear opportunity to how you can work with different organizations, including ours, that we can help maybe build that bridge around um, helping to gain trust, but also really about um, the language. Um, the, the last piece I'd add here, I think is how can DHS sort of a challenge maybe to D our colleagues at DHS of how do you take a leadership role in really building networks between these, our faith-based communities, um, particularly around communities that are, you know, more sophisticated in how they set up secure, um, systems and, or spaces, um, and, or maybe how they've had more success in securing funding, um, so that's where I'd probably start for our conversation. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you. I think you lifted up some really key points, in particular around trust. Um, and I think that to us is really at the, the heart of our office is why we have and, and believe in the importance of community engagement and engaging with some of the leaders that you're hearing from today. Because we know it is not government alone. It is because we are connected to the persons you're seeing on your screen and many of you who are joining us today. Um, it is because we have those relationships on um, the building the trust um, and building those networks that we can better serve. And so I thank you for some of those things are challenging us, Cabinet, to, to better engage, to better be supportive, and to think about language access, language needs, and the immigrant community. So again, I appreciate you highlighting uh, those things that are top of mind. I'm going to turn it over to our colleague, Stephanie. Uh, welcome to hear from you. How can we get better engaged with SCAN and the good work that you all are doing there? Hi. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for having me uh, on such a such an important collaborative topic. I can't echo enough of what have, has just been said. I spent over two decades as a special agent with the FBI working crisis management um, and specializing in weapons of mass destruction. So getting to know your partners before a crisis is probably one of the biggest takeaways. Uh, we, we learned the hard way after 9-11, right? Because we didn't have that infrastructure in place. We didn't know who our partners were and we didn't know what resources we all brought to the table. So although SCN's main focus is working with Jewish communities and partners across all of North America, so we cover Canada as well, we do offer consultation on safety and security matters. We provide crisis management support to our interfaith partners, um, and it includes many of our training courses that are open to those beyond that Jewish community. A lot of it is we have a, a white paper out called Firearms and the Faithful. And I know the biggest question that comes up, most topics are, how do I arm people? Do I need armed um, security guards, off-duty police officers? Where do I start with that? And that paper really starts to dive into that. What are the legal ramifications of that? What are my liabilities with that? So I, I always say you've been in one church or synagogue, you've been in one church or synagogue. Every one of us has different needs. Uh, we live in dem different de demographics. So it's got to be based individually. I I'm not, that's unfortunate, but there is no one size fits all. But a lot of our resources that are on our website go into that. Our CEO, Michael Masters, also serves on the DHS Faith-Based Secu um, Security and Communications Advisory Board. So he's part of that partnership, helping for a more consistent safety and security protocols. And that includes the training modules, right? And, and how do we collect and share information? So through our website, securecommunitynetwork.org, all spelled out, anyone can request support that we have. Thanks for having me today. Well, thank you. And thank you. As she mentioned, um, uh, Secure Community Network does work nationwide. They do provide a lot of resources, especially trainings online. Um, so you certainly want to get on their listserv um, as it relates to opportunities that they offer free and available to the public. So just want to highlight uh, that as well. Now we turn over to my colleague, uh, Chief. Uh, we certainly are grateful for you, um, your several decades experience in law enforcement that you now bring to federal government service. Uh, what is top of mind for you? Um, because I believe that 
that you really, I think, the fact that you bring your experience uh, working um, across our nation in this space as a law enforcement officer and now in government, how do you think we can do better um, in working together um, as a federal agency and within our, with our, uh, both our nonprofit partners as well as our faith-based partners? I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Nicole. And, and again, uh, I'm glad everyone is here and participating in this conversation. So I look at this from big and small. Um, the bulk of my law enforcement career across uh, three different jurisdictions um, and three different decades uh, really kind of underscores that uh, communities are very, very different. And when it comes to connecting, uh, yes, FEMA is, is a behemoth of an organization and has resources. But the bottom line, when it comes down to it, it comes down to that connectivity, not only at the community level, but I'll even go smaller than that. And that is even in the individual house of worship, we're all responsible for uh, for its safety and its security. We all know who attends uh, our houses of worship. Now, other than those actors that come externally, we have to look at behavior and access to firearms in that in, in those contexts. And I will tell you that, um, and again, in my experience coming from a, a community where I had the opportunity or, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the misfortune of having had three active shooting situations in my community, the most infamous uh, being the congresswoman that was shot. And I will tell you in that capacity, more often than not, there are signs and there are indicators that behavior is about to occur. So when you start talking about uh, churches, and I will tell you that in my home church, um, I sit very strategic, very strategically in my church for a reason. And that's also coordinated with the pastor of my church. And so those are the kinds of conversations that need to take place on the macro level of the resources coming from the government and on that uh, micro level in, in those individual unique uh, church communities. Well, that's a perfect segue because you're right. Um, there, there are many things that we need to start thinking about at multiple levels. So I'm going to put it back to you all. What are some three steps that we can start taking tomorrow? Um, I want our attendees to feel like they have some resources that you can provide them, some real basic three steps around improving the safety and security of their place of worship or community space ahead of the next religious observances. Again, three things that you think uh, top of mind that might be helpful. I'm going to start with Stephanie. Um, if you have any that are top of mind for you, what are some three things you think? Oh, you can have three. one, but if you've got three, let's go for the three. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I want to caveat on, on what Chief just said. Um, there are behavior indicators. Unfortunately, in America, with the growing uh, the growth of technology, I think Americans have become more and more distracted by their phones. Um, we see an increase in lack of what I call cell phone discipline. Okay, if your head is in your phone, you're going to miss the behavior indicators. Police aren't going to see these indicators. Citizens are going to see the indicators and be able to report them. So I want to talk about three key security steps that I think are universal and applicable regardless of your faith. And I think it will help enhance security protocols. The first one is for each um, congregation, church, house of worship to form a security committee and conduct an assessment. And what I mean by that is every... Community, like I said earlier, is different, right? Um, you have to appoint a committee and an individual who maybe will oversee the effort and ensure follow-up because I think a lot of times things fall through the track, the cracks. Then conduct a threat vulnerability assessment. We don't know what we don't know, right? A security strategy begins with understanding maybe where your strengths are, but also where your gaps and your weaknesses are. Um, my caveat to that is that has to be an assessment that's conducted by a reputable professional familiar with the unique needs, the requirements, the challenges, even the grants, right? Because a lot of these threat assessments we're using to then get money to help with our physical security. All right, so that's one. Two, I want to address access issues. So if I'm going to take you back a little bit here. A, a locked door was the only thing that stopped a gunman in, in Hell, Germany, if you remember, from attacking congregants in that synagogue. So ensuring all facilities have a single main entrance that can be locked and monitored, it's vital to security. And this is probably one of the bigger reasons where security fails us, right? Because we want to be welcoming and open um, but at the same time, we have to balance that security with it. So locked doors, it's it's easy to, to start. 
to put into place. Third, it's training. So train, then train again, right? Security is that nitty gritty business, if you will. Security plans need to be practiced. I don't think they are. I don't think they're read. But if they're going to be effective uh, in an emergency, staff need to know what they are. They need to practice them. They need to even be scenario-based as well. We need to build what I call muscle memory, and we need to run drills to kind of reinforce the training we have. I do have a fourth one. I'm sorry. But the fourth one is that first aid and medical supplies. So every facility should have a functional AED, a first aid kit. And above all, we see these shootings all the time. And, and what don't we have? We don't have a simple stop the bleed kit to use in emergencies, tourniquets, gauze, things of that nature, and that everyone knows where they are. And so they could run to them. God forbid they would need to use them. So those are my, my top. Well, thank you, Stephanie. So from first aid to training, to locking the doors and also getting some threat assessments. So I just want to acknowledge that our, your local law enforcement, um, sometimes your fire, local fire station, and even um, in the Department of Homeland Security have something called protective security advisors. Um, all of them can do uh, threat assessments and or can come into your place of worship or community center and just do an assessment of the um, some of the threats that you might want to consider within your place of worship and or community center. So that is free and available to you. Uh, it is important to have a good relationship with your law enforcement as well as your local firefighter. They should be your friend. That's someone you want to invite for coffee uh, when it is a, we call blue skies, not gray skies. So uh, we want to encourage those relationships. Um, and with that, since I am in the spirit of law enforcement, I'm going to turn it right back over to you, Chief. Put some top of mind things for you that you're thinking about. Very simply, uh, and that is that conversation with your local law enforcement. When an event like this happens in your uh, house of worship, it affects the entire community. I, I promise you, your local law enforcement wants to help. Make contact. That's number one. Number two is uh, when I talk about securing a, a, a building or an infrastructure, we talk about rings of security. So you, you have concentric rings. So you've got somebody outside, you've got somebody inside uh, and you're paying attention in, in, that, in, in that relationship. Um, and what, what you saw in Lakewood was exactly that. You had folks who were able to um, stop her before she actually even got into the sanctuary itself. And so again, those concentric circles. And then the last thing I'll say is every police officer that ever worked for me always carried a trauma kit. And the reason why is there are never enough bandages to go around when things happen. And so I, I agree with Stephanie, and that is uh, first aid, first aid, first aid, stop the bleeding. Excellent. Excellent. All right. I'm going to put a big flag for until, uh, what, would it stop the bleed? I know that's a DHS uh, initiative as well. Are you the helping to help arrives? I'm going to put a big plug in for that as well. Another great training and resource um, that you want to tap into. Thank you so much, uh, Chief, for what you shared. Uh, Cabinet, I'd love to hear from you. What is top of mind? Three steps people can do tomorrow um, that you feel that can help them to protect their safety and security. Yeah, sure. I, this is the question you don't want to go third or fourth, right? Because I think all the a lot of the good answers got taken. As like to, to be additive, um, where and I think it's to what Stephanie said about creating a plan, practicus, practicing it with your staff and your congregation, right? Let them know that hey, in the event something tragic happens, here's how we need to respond. And I think particularly for those of us that have communities that are have some element of immigrant status that are maybe not English language um, proficient, that's really important. And to show them that, hey, there can actually be a plan. Um, I love Chief Terrence's comments about engaging with local law enforcement. And, and I think that's something I had too, of making sure that you engage with local law enforcement so that they understand your congregation before something like this happens, that they know the layout. That's actually really very critical. I think we found that out with the the massacre at the Oak Creek Gurdwara in 2011. And then they can also understand your community concerns. I think that's a really critical part. Um, last, I guess I would add, how can you begin to think about what are more secure spaces, be it, be it like be through technology, as Stephanie said, through hardscapes, through other opportunities to begin to create some element of security? Um, and again, potentially leveraging grants like the MPSG or other things to uh, be longer term solutions there. 
Exactly. Well, thank you. You're talking about that nonprofit security grant um, that I know many of you know about and certainly hope we could drop it in the chat so folks can learn more about FEMA's nonprofit security grant. Um, and equally, I think it was important um, that you lift it up um, because you can never say it enough. Practice, practice, practice the plan. Um, I was having a conversation with a faith leader and said, when's the last time you told your congregation where the exit signs were? And they paused. I said, let's just, let's just start there. <laughs> what do we do in the event of an emergency? Oh, okay. Just let folks know um, and make sure it's clear. As you said, and maybe we need to make sure it's known in other languages, especially for those congregants who are in other languages. Make sure folks know where to exit in the event of emergency. Where do you evacuate? What do you do? Absolutely. Um, and so what you've lifted up is so important, and it's worth repeating. Um, another thing I remember the faith leaders saying, we talked about the importance of the power of hello. Um, as, as we all know, um, and I know that uh, our friends at Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security have uh, used this uh, very well, and it's something that we have to remember. Um, I think, Stephanie, you talk about the fact that we are so connected to our phones that we forget sometimes even say, Hi, how you doing, right? Because you kind of walk on with your, your face at your screen. Um, but what that does is when we're able to connect eye to eye with folks to say that I see you, I'm engaged with you, and I really want to connect with you. Uh, and what that can do to someone who potentially may have been thinking about causing harm. So again, recognizing some of these techniques that could be helpful. And April, if you want to round us out, even if it's one or two, if you got three, awesome. But if there's something top of mind that you also want to add to the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And what great information to share today, right? So I had my three um, of knowing your risk and your plan. Um, I know Stephanie talked about the organizational side of that a little bit about reaching out and identifying um, particularly your protective security advisor and making sure that um, you want to engage them for security assessment to be conducted. But particularly on the individual side, thinking about if I walk into my house of worship um, this coming weekend, what can I do as an individual? I can be aware of my risk and I can know my surroundings, right? So I can look around, like you said, where are the exits? If I choose to run, where am I running to? If I choose to hide, where are the closets? Where are the discrete spaces, the cabinets, somewhere that I could climb and hide for a bit? And if I choose to fight, knowing my surroundings again, what's available to me um, that I have access to in that particular environment that I may be in on that particular day? Second for me was get trained. We've hit that one over and over again today. I'm an ER nurse by background. Stopping the bleed is one of the most critical things that you can do and having access, access to first aid equipment. But also some of our volunteer agencies offer safety and security trainings for free. Um, so seeking out where you can obtain support, um, whether it's Secure Communities Network or other organizations and partners that provide that. And then my last one was seeking the funding and resources, right? So exploring those grant opportunities, you mentioned like the nonprofit security grants programming and other opportunities for funding, even if it's building a regional coalition of houses of worship and sharing resources are critical um, in those environments to our success. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. All very important things to highlight, all very important things for us to think about. Um, and as we said, we, we probably could all, all four of or what this five of us here could say practice, practice, practice. Um, because you have to practice your plan. We encourage our young people in schools to do what? Fire drills. They're now doing after shooter drills. If our kids are doing it monthly, I think we too should be doing it in our daily lives. So it becomes something that we are preparing ourselves mentally um, in the event we are faced with a tragic tragic event, we know that we won't stop and freeze, which is a normal, healthy response. That's what one would do. But when you've equipped yourself and you've prepared, prepared yourself psychologically, you can start moving into action because you've practiced it so much that it becomes something that you do naturally. And so we want to get everyone in that space uh, to move. So um, especially in a time of an event. So I hope we have some key takeaways that you can take note of today, because I know it's hard when you're hearing so much important information. It's like, what are some things that I can walk away right now? Nicole, uh, can I interrupt please, you real quick? So you bring, something, you bring something up, you know, to give three tips is hard, right? Because there's so many, but um, kind of caveat on what you said, what April said, even with um, the chief said, we teach people to survive for at least five minutes, three to five minutes on their own. Why do we say up to five minutes? Because that's how long it takes police to to respond. And w when they get there, I mean, they are coming. God bless them for the job they do. Um, I'm married to a law enforcement officer, so I get it, right? But we have to survive on our own. And fear creeps in, right? And it's probably one of the worst emotions we could ever have. We, we cling to it. 
It brings us comfort for whatever reason, but it paralyzes us. So that committing to action is something that we teach. And, and like Nicole said, whether you're going to run, whether you're going to hide or fight, but if you don't have the training and you don't know what your options are, you can't think through it and fear creeps in. So it, it really is important. And you are your own advocate for your own safety. Like I said, police are coming, um, but their first, their first kind of call to duty is to eliminate that threat. And then the other thing is that stop the bleed. Um, you know, I, I unfortunately had to work Stoneman Douglas, that shooting. And afterwards, my husband and I brought our entire community together of children. And we taught them on our back patio how to apply a tourniquet and how to uh, pack a wound. Because every child, and, and children are so resilient, they do. Uh, active shooter training. They, if they can do it, we can. And they were on the edge of their seats trying to learn all of this and enthralled in it. Um, it's such an easy, easy skill set to learn. And, and I think it's a responsibility of all of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we could just wrap up really quickly with this last question. What advice do you have for government partners on where to start a conversation on safety and security, especially for smaller places of worship or even community organizations that might not have the security and or safety expertise? They may not have it. Where, where do you start? I'll, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to jump in. Yeah, Kavna, please. Welcome to hear from you. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things that stood out to me. So one, I think like I talked about earlier, DHS is sort of this nexus of a really unique position. So how can you all proactively kind of engage communities that are doing this work at different capacities already, right? So if you understand that so-and-so has sophistication in how they set up security, how they did a threat assessment, with these smaller communities that don't have that, maybe don't, again, language access, awareness, funds, whatever it might be, how do we connect them to create almost sort of community mentorship programs? I think that could be really, really very remarkably um, powerful. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the other I think we've seen is a lot of, I think, the, the security apparatus and the, the conversations and the content is really focused on folks that are sort of in the beltway or kind of on these coastal uh, metropolises. And when we look at these smaller communities, they don't have access to that understanding, under access to even be able to discern what's being told to them. So how do we simplify things and make it that somebody doesn't need a PhD maybe to understand how best they can evaluate the the security of their of their religious spaces? Um, the, the last I would say is how do we how does <clears throat> excuse me sorry, coming down with a little bit of a cold, how can DHS begin to develop that trust? Um, and I think part of that comes of really understanding who your community is, whether it's something as simple as the hate crimes data we talked about the, before, the violence against places of worship. How do we internalize that? Come to the community and say, hey, we understand that this is a problem. We want to learn more. And then offer those solutions and offer not even solutions, first of all, I think it's resources, in a language and in a in a cadence that they can understand. No, all very, very helpful. All very, very helpful, especially talking about how are we better communicating around the needs of people locally who don't have resources, um, especially distilling it in such a way that it can be, it's usable, it's accessible, and can be um, shared. Um, Chief, the last 30 seconds, um, I welcome your, your thoughts on this comment, and we'll wrap up our time together on this panel. Chief. You know, I sit in, in uh, the con congressional chambers uh, during a, a judiciary uh, committee meeting, and I sat next to a parent um, from Newtown uh, after the shooting there. And it was uh, almost a year to the day to the shooting in my community. And it was, you know what, we saw this on the news. It was on the news for a few days, and we didn't think about it. The short answer to this is have the conversation. There are a lot of federal resources out there, but you have to go, go to them. The easy part is start the conversation locally so you know that you, you want to look and then seek them out. Excellent, excellent. And again, as shared, um, many of our, our panelists here are a resource to you, um, us, ourselves within the Department of Homeland Security. You'll be hearing more from us. Uh, we have others who will be sharing as well. Uh, but we want to thank Stephanie, April, Cabinet, as well as Chief Perry Tehran, 
for your time and your energy, your expertise, your three tips that you shared with us that we hope that were actionable, that you all have taken note of, that you can start doing tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all and thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to our next speaker. I uh, want to welcome um, two speakers to focus on the, and, um, the PowerPoint, please, focusing on considerations to help communities recover from acts of targeted violence. We will first hear from April Lipinski. She's the mass care lead for FEMA Region 8. As well, we'll hear from Richard Brannigan. He's a regional executive interim chief operating officer for Connecticut and Rhode Island's American Red Cross. First turning it over to April, and then we will hear from Richard. Thank you so much, April. Good afternoon, all. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm the Mass Care Lead for FEMA Region 8. I live in beautiful Denver, Colorado, and have the wonderful opportunity to support our state and tribal nations in preparing for and responding to mass care events. Uh, these types of activities would include sheltering, uh, feeding, distribution of emergency supplies, evacuation support, uh, reunification of families, and support for household pets and service animals. Um, typically in an active shooter uh, mass casualty event, FEMA is not traditionally involved in the response outside of some possible communication with local partners. However, if mass casualty events occur that meet the requirements of an emergency declaration or major disaster declaration, FEMA can support the mass care response. Uh, we can assist the state, tribe, or territory with the coordination of partner organizations and by providing material support such as food, uh, water, uh, medical supplies, and other uh, emergency equipment. Additionally, depending on the type of declaration, FEMA's individual assistance program may also um, support. Uh, for instance, during the Surfside building collapse in, in Florida, uh, that, that was more of a unique type of event for us. Uh, the governor requested an emergency declaration and the activation of some of FEMA's individual assistance programs. Uh, these programs are designed to help survivors with critical needs, such as locating a safe and sanitary place to live while they look for long-term housing. So during this incident, the FEMA Voluntary Agency Liaison, also known as AVAL, I'm sure a few of you know that word, uh, was also instrumental in the coordination of private uh, nonprofit organizations who were supporting state-funded disaster case management programs. Uh, finally, as many of you are aware, FEMA, uh, FEMA's Emergency Management Institute, EMI, also supports whole community partners in preparing for active shooter incidents by providing training, exercises, and even grant funding to assist state and local law enforcement. In fact, in the past five years, FEMA's active shooter exercises have been successfully implemented in 367 jurisdictions with a total of 5,720 participants. That's pretty amazing. Uh, now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to Richard Brannigan with the American Red Cross to speak to you about the Red Cross support during mass casualty incidents. Go ahead and take it away, Richard. Thanks, April. And thanks, everyone, for joining this very, very important call and to our partners at the federal level for making all of this happen. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've had some experience in mass casualty working for the Red Cross and representing our, our volunteers. Um, from my perspective, and the chief mentioned this earlier, I was at Sandy Hook uh, the first night in the firehouse um, and experienced that chaos and the emotions that went with it. Um, I've also been to Las Vegas uh, Buffalo, uh, New York, and most recently Lewiston. So I speak from, ex speak from experience about the relationship and how important faith leadership is in the mass casualty response and recovery for a community. So we're going to spend some time uh, talking about what if a tragic event does happen in your community, despite all of your best laid plans and your awareness and your assessments and so forth. So if we can go to the first slide, please. So there are, as April said, there's a couple of different types of events. Uh, the natural and man-made disasters, Maui being one of the most recent and, and most uh, substantial. Uh, but the Red Cross does respond in collaboration and in partnership with FEMA um, under the Stafford Act and, and our congressional charter. Um, our mission at the Red Cross is to alleviate human suffering. 
um, in the face of emergencies through the uh, power of our volunteers and the generosity of our donors. So when we respond with FEMA, we are responding as a separate nonprofit uh, humanitarian uh, part of a worldwide organization, but we do so as as a, an emergency support function lead under Mass Care, um, and we work on sheltering and feeding principally with with FEMA and our partners. Um, I'm also uh, happy and and recognize my former colleague April Wood uh, from the National uh, Volunteer Organ Organizations Active in Disaster, and we are a proud member of that organization and use those principles and connections and resources to further our mission and our support for the people that we serve. There are a few other types of mass casualty incidents that we respond to, um, and they are what we call legislative incidents in the non-Stafford Act response, which would be an aviation um, or a rail disaster, and that's with the National Transportation Safety Board. We have an, a memorandum of understanding uh, with them, and we've had that for several years now, and we are their designated nonprofit uh, to help with uh, the Family Assistance Center, coordination of disaster uh, mental health and emotional care, uh, children's care, volunteers, and so forth. We also have recently signed, as of last May, a memorandum of understanding with the FBI Victims uh, Services Unit, Office of Victims Assistance, um, and that is an amazing partnership uh, that was recently uh, exercised for the first time in Lewiston, Maine. Um, next slide, please. This is a very brief timeline about what uh, a mass casualty incidents might look like. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, I did experience that first zero hour or the first several hours thereafter in Sandy Hook. And the chaos is um, is such an emotional impact on, on folks and recovering for that, getting into the reunification and family reception area um, is key. But the emotions and the difference between a mass casualty incident um, and a what I would call a natural disaster um, is substantial and significant. Those emotional responses do take a toll. Um, and in the mass casualty incident response world, um, it's very common to see law enforcement, police, fire, emergency management um, at various levels pretty much step away when the notification of the next of kin or the family uh, status, health status has been uh, completed. Um, and that's when the medical examiner or the county coroner or whomever has completed their work. Um, and our road in mass casualty incident response is so far down from there. We have such a long way to go uh, with the establishment of a family assistance center that is set up uh, specifically for the victims and their families. Um, and it is not to be confused with a community grieving center. Family Assistance Center is, is a specific private location that is geared only uh, for those members uh, who were significantly and directly impacted. Um, and it also plays into effect when the FBI, as we did in Lewiston, when the FBI is conducting their investigation at, on the shooting. So it's in partnership with law enforcement uh, but is geared specifically to be a support to the victims and their families. And then we get into long-term community recovery uh, and resiliency. And in many, many mass casualty incidents that are crime-related um, or in airline uh, disasters, there is funding available uh, from various sources to help the community recover. Um, and one of the key areas in a community recovery is the leadership from the faith-based community, uh, from the faith leaders of the community um, that know uh, where those people in need are because they see them on Saturday or Sunday or Friday, they see them on the street or, or, or um, in services during the week. They know who's, at, who's in need and they know how best to serve those populations. Um, so next slide, please. So this is just a couple of different scenarios of how different each mass casualty incident uh, can be. And to paraphrase um, one of the earlier speakers, I think Stephanie Viegas said, if you've worked uh, one, you've worked one. Well, if you've worked one mass casualty incident, you've worked one. Um, and each variety is different. Um, each variable is is different. And when you start to, to put these together, 
the language is, whether it's a criminal act or not criminal act, whether it's a hate crime, who has jurisdiction? Um, what is the scale? The scale when we worked Sandy Hook uh, was a very small community. But when we worked Las Vegas, it was Las Vegas. And the scale is absolutely uh, indescribable um, in comparison. Um, and when we look at the variables like religion, it, uh, an event does not have to be in your house of worship, worship to have an impact on you as a faith leader in your community. Um, and it's really more common for you as a leader in that community to step up and help that community heal. Um, likewise, if there are if there is a need for language translation or there is a need for cultural sensitivity, um, for me to respond to an incident like Buffalo, New York, where it was a hate crime and a in a 95% uh, majority uh, black community, um, it's important for me to be there uh, to listen and to rely on the people of the local community who can set the tone and steer the direction of long-term recovery um, that we can assist with. We have expertise in the Red Cross. Uh, our mission is, is fairly clear. We're, we're known across the world as being a humanitarian organization. We follow the same principles um, as, as we do worldwide, but it's important to know that local community. Next slide, please. So these are some of the things that the Red Cross can do in a mass casualty incident. And, and first and foremost, it's that integrated care and condolence team, uh, which you'll see includes spiritual care. And our spiritual care in the Red Cross is non-denominational. We are following the VOAD, uh, the national VOAD points of uh, consensus when it comes to how we administer and how we support spiritual care in the communities that we're working. Um, and we have seen that uh, really work very, very well, as I mentioned in Buffalo, but also in Las Vegas, Nevada, where, where you would say it's very difficult to find a faith-based or a spiritual community there. And, and it's not. Las Vegas is a community, just like any other. Um, and so listening to the local leadership and making sure that we're connecting with local leadership uh, is very, very important to us. Um, mass care and feeding is something that we do in natural disasters, but also in mass casualty incidents. In Buffalo, um, when the top shooting took place, the supermarket was closed for several months. Feeding and hunger in that community, which was already a food desert, became a major issue for us to tackle. A disaster children's services. This is a group that we work with under agreement with the Red Cross and the Church of the Brethren. And they are specifically trained to deal with and to support children who are impacted by uh, natural disasters and in particular mass casualty incidents. So in Lewiston, they had their own room set up and they were giving out bracelets from Taylor Swift and they were playing games and keeping the kids um, just a little bit distracted and supported while their parents and while their caregivers um, were taking the steps for their own personal recovery and helping with the FBI um, uh, investigation couple of things to point out that we do not do um, during um, mass casualty incidents is we are we are an organization that relies on the generosity of the American public. But in these types of incidents, we provide the service as an honor and we do not conduct fundraising activities of any kind during a mass casualty incident. And we also limit our media statements to only those that support those victims and their families that we are serving. Um, so it's a little bit different. But there are some points uh, that that you and the spiritual care community and the, the faith community can help us with. And I point out just just one, and that is the Family Assistance Center Companions. It's, it's an area that uh, was put into practice in Las Vegas where people come into the Family Assistance Center and they receive an escort from one highly trained individual to take them through the process. Um, and in the case of Buffalo, those individuals were trusted agents from local churches who the, their friends and family members knew and were able to go through the process. So next slide, please. Just a couple of other points of emphasis about what we've observed in mass casualty incidents. As I said earlier, uh, faith cannot be overvalued. 
those points of consensus that we work in. Um, I have seen faith leaders uh, like at Sandy Hook, Reverend Matthew Krebin and, and Monsignor Weiss were amazing leaders in their own community because they knew the community. Monsignor Weiss lost eight children uh, from his first communion class in that shooting. Uh, and it was just amazing to see the leadership that was exerted from those folks who really know their community. Familiarity with partners and making sure that you've trained, making sure that you know who your local connections are. And your, as the chief said, your local police department who would love to walk through your, your facilities and help you with the planning and exercising those plans. Um, also, making sure that if you're involved with long-term recovery, you're sitting at the table and look around the table to, to see who's not at the table because it's your community and you could best uh, represent them and make sure that they're listened to uh, going forward. Um, next slide, please. So here's some contact information. At the Red Cross, we do a couple of things. Uh, we catch people in the process, regardless of where, of where they are, figuratively and literally. And our role really is to wrap a blanket around the community. In this particular case, in a mass casualty incident, um, it's a case where the emotions are, are so much higher, the stakes are so much higher, um, and we're very proud of the work that we do at the Red Cross, um, and no more so than in, in the responses that I've been affiliated with um, and representing uh, and having the honor to represent our Red Cross um, mission across uh, the nation. And Nicole Wood, back to you. Well, thank you so much, both April as well as Richard, for sharing some incredible considerations to help us uh, communities recover from acts of targeted violence. We appreciate both of your leadership, uh, your expertise and talent that you have shared with us today. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it back to my colleagues within the Department of Homeland Security. I'm going to welcome Daniel Abreu. He's the Deputy Associate Director for Security Programs in the Infrastructure Security Division within Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. He will share with us physical security performance goals for faith-based communities. Welcome, Daniel, to the conversation. Glad to have you. Hey, thanks, Nicole. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to take a quick moment just to thank you, Nicole, uh, and the team for coordinating this event and for the opportunity to participate. The dialogue has been exceptional, so thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, my name is Daniel Abreu, and I'm with the DHS Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with us, uh, we lead national efforts to build public and private sector security capacity to address both physical and cyber risks. One of our top priorities is to enhance the security of public gatherings by developing capabilities that address the wide range of risks we face as a nation. And a particular point of emphasis is houses of worship. For more than a decade, we've partnered with many faith-based community leaders, including many of you on the call today, uh, to develop resources to support your efforts in keeping houses of worship and congregants safe. Our products emphasize easy to use security measures and focus on maintaining the necessary open and welcoming environment of houses of worship that was mentioned earlier during the roundtable. Many of you who participated in previous webinars have heard from us about the various capabilities we make available, including our protective security advisors that Nicole mentioned earlier, resources and trainings focused on conflict prevention, active shooter preparedness, bombing prevention, school safety, hostile vehicle mitigation. We also have uh, an exercise capability, several self-assessment tools, including one specifically for houses of worship, and many others. And to Cabinet's point earlier, we've also translated several of the resources that we have available across CISA into multiple languages to try to reach as many communities as possible. And we're continuously looking for opportunities to translate new products. What I would like to focus on today, though, as Nicole mentioned, is a product we recently released that hopefully many of you have seen, but we'll make sure it's provided again, uh, which is the physical security performance goals for faith-based communities. And I'm just gonna speak to it just very briefly, and then I'll pivot to the slides a little bit more specifically. But we developed this product at the request of Secretary Mayorkas and released it in early December, leading up to several religious holidays. And it does address the request that I've seen uh, and that I've noticed on the Q&A tab today regarding security practices. So I'll, I'll go through some of that uh, very briefly. 
But we were very fortunate to have collaborated with multiple interfaith partners in its development to ensure the document best addresses community needs. And that, in our minds, was the foundational component of the effort, making sure that we had buy-in from our partners who will use the information. Otherwise, it won't work. So the document provides easy to use with minimal technical jargon, again, to have Neat's earlier point, options to enhance security in a manner that's tailorable to the needs of any facility. And it can also serve as a great single source because it includes references to other available products that can inform tangible actions. And because every organization does have differing levels of funds available for security and varying levels of tolerance for risk, we try to focus to the extent possible on the no and low cost solutions to incentivize implementation. And to facilitate usability, because as we've heard in, during the roundtable, not every house of worship uh, or community has that level of security expertise. We try to facilitate and make it as easy as possible by categorizing the information into five overarching buckets to allow the user to determine the areas they want to focus on most. And those five buckets are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Under identify, we talk about establishing a planning team, identifying and understanding potential risks and creating plans. Under protect, it's predominantly about implementing security measures and Stephanie, Chief Perry and others captured some of this uh, during the round table, but it includes things like keeping landscaping trimmed to preclude hiding places, training personnel on active threat response, maintaining doors and windows in working order, monitoring parking areas and ensuring areas around the facility are well lit but also establishing partnerships with local law enforcement, which was previously discussed as well, and considering personal safety and seeking funds, which also was touched on as well. Under DETECT, it's all about identifying suspicious activity and taking appropriate action, actions, including through de-escalation techniques, and Nicole alluded to the powerful little resource that we make available. In RESPOND, it's implementing a response plan and establishing a reunification location. And finally, recover its reconstituting services and providing memorialization, developing an after action plan and implementing additional protective measures where necessary. It is important to highlight that the use of the document is completely voluntary and it doesn't impose any requirements on the community, but it does provide a series of recommendations to, uh, to either establish or improve security practices. So of course, we strongly encourage everyone to take a look at it. Since its release just a few months ago, we've received great feedback um, and it's garnered a lot of attention given its relevance around the previous holiday season. And of course, certainly applicable to the impending holidays, uh, but also the continued threats posed to communities and the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict and its potential impacts in the homeland that was discussed during the uh, threat briefing. So I'll pivot here just to uh, quickly show the uh, sort of structure of the document. Uh, this slide here speaks to a lot of what I already mentioned about the goals and why we developed the document. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is the essence of it. On the left side, it's the five overarching buckets that I talked about. On the right side, it's the structure of the document. It's very easy to follow. On a security practice or goal, um, I'll mention and show what that looks like in the next slide, but in every single instance, we have an outcome. So what are we trying to achieve with that goal? the risks that we're trying to address. And in the scope is who within the community or the house of worship is responsible for those actions. And then ultimately in the recommended actions section, a, a list of very specific tangible actions that individuals and uh, communities can take to buy down risk. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the overarching uh, goal areas. We have the five buckets and then within each one of them, the goals that uh, we talk about in the document and within each one of these, that format and structure that I talked about uh, in the preceding slide is covered with a lot of specificity. And like I mentioned in the Q&A tab, I noticed a lot of uh, requests and questions about um, security best practices. This document can serve as a great uh, first stop uh, to achieving some of those uh, requests and, and answering some of them. But I'm also happy to provide um, my email uh, information if there's any questions or if anyone wants to reach out more specifically and coordinate with us, I'm happy to do that as well. And I see here there's a barcode for uh, some of our web uh, material as well, but also happy to provide my actual email address if anyone wants to discuss directly or 
uh, of course, connect you with the right protective security advisors that Nicole discussed. Uh, with that, I, I want to be respectful of time. So, uh, Nicole, uh, back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. As you can note, uh, that is truly, um, we would consider it still in government talk. That's still hot off the press uh, because it is just months old and an incredible resource. Um, I think, Daniel, to your point, there are so many things that are within it that really are some actionable steps that you can start doing now. Um, I think Daniel did an excellent job highlighting some just basic things we can start thinking about as places of worship or community spaces that you can do to protect, uh, for the, in particular as it relates to your safety and security. So as noted on this chart, there is an opportunity to receive more information, the wealth in, of information within SISA they have of protected places of worship. And I'm sure Daniel Hill will also share his contact for those who want to do a direct follow-up on the resource that he just shared. Again, Daniel, we're grateful for your partnership. I'm certainly grateful to be able to help lift in all the resources you do uh, because you, your, all, your agency and yourself have done a tremendous job uh, pouring into the faith and community groups um, and providing practical resources um, that are supporting our communities, in particular, our protective security advisors who are out in our communities, serving in communities, providing support um, at the local level. And again, this is free and available to you. So thank you so much, Daniel. And with that, we're going to turn over to another great colleague of mine, Peter Mina. He serves as the deputy office, excuse me, the deputy officer for programs and compliance in the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties within Department of Homeland Security. So grateful to have you, Peter, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, <clears throat> so as Nicole said, I'm the deputy officer for programs and compliance at the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, or CRCO. And first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to Nicole and to Marcus Coleman, um, from the DHS Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships for inviting me today and for being part of it, uh, this great program. Uh, also, I want to, it's great to see my DHS and DOJ partners, as well as you know members of the community and community organizations that have made this such a rich presentation. So as a designated office to protect, um, within DHS to protect civil rights and civil liberties, CRCL is really concerned with many of the challenges faced by faith-based communities, in particular, as you confront targeted violence. Uh, domestic violent extremism poses not just a threat to life and property, but also a threat to the ability of persons in the United States to safely exercise their civil rights and civil liberties, especially for religious, ethnic, and racial minority communities. In protecting civil rights and civil liberties, CRCL works across the department to support efforts to combat domestic violent extremism in all forms. And that includes working with our DHS partners to protect faith communities and other minority communities disproportionately impacted by targeted violence while ensuring that civil rights and civil liberties are not violated by the department's activities. And that, you know, translates to a whole host of uh, DHS operations, whether it's my colleague from the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, even beyond the four quarters of the department, we also do a lot of great work with fusion centers, which I believe my colleagues have also mentioned. So in 2023, you know, we've continued to host um, and participate in important engagements for faith communities, confronting increased threats to and targeted violence. For example, we participated in the interagency coordination group that the White House formed on in December of 2022 on countering anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and related forms of discrimination and bias. And through our regular community engagement efforts, which, you know, just to highlight, is part of the core of what CRCL does, is really engaging with communities and bringing that uh, feedback and input back to department and component leadership to inform department uh, policies, programs, and activities. Uh, we're working to build trust and establish a routine process for communication and coordination with diverse communities and faith leaders and organizations across the country. And to give um, just one example of that, in December of last year, um, CRCL worked with our Office of Partnership and Engagement as well as with CISA to hold in-person meetings with Jewish and Muslim community leaders in the Midwest. We met separately with 15 Jewish community representatives and six Muslim community representatives to receive concerns from stakeholders, provide information on DHS protection resources, and respond to questions. Um, and my office, the, uh, the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, is committed to responding to the needs and concerns of, you, of your communities. And we work with our DHS partners to ensure that the department is available to assess your needs and provide access to DHS protection resources. And so we regularly engage with faith-based communities and have, have conducted security awareness town hall engagements faith communities in coordination with our federal partners, including CISA, FEMA, and the DHS Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. And we continue to address the civil rights and civil liberties related concerns 
of impacted communities, including Muslim, Jewish, LGBTQ+, Latino, Native American, and Black communities. And we seek to reduce barriers. And again, none of this is possible without the work of our community partners. Uh, our mission is not complete without that partnership and that bridge between the department and, and the community. Um, if you happen to be a faith leader working with local communities and are not already connected to CRCL's community engagement team, please feel free to reach out to me or contact the community engagement section directly at communityengagement at hq.dhs.gov. And again, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. It's such It's been such a great um, opportunity to participate in such a robust discussion. And again, remember that protection of civil rights and civil liberties is core to protecting against domestic violence extremism and happy to be a part of the department's efforts um, to combat that threat. Back to you, Nicole. Well, thank you so much, Peter. And I think to Peter's point and my other colleagues in with DHS, as you can see, engaging in partnership in community is something that's valued. It is something that's deeply embedded in part of our mission. And into Peter's office, um, he wants to make sure that we can better engage um, around civil rights and civil liberties um, issues that are impacting your community. Um, so we thank Peter and thank you for what you shared. Uh, we will wrap up our time hearing from our colleague, um, Zach Usher, he's the Deputy Director for Individual Assistance Division, and certainly grateful, Zach, for you and your leadership for allowing us to share this platform um, with you um, because of your uh, office um, and also the VALs who have supported us in this um, voice call. So again, turn it over to Zach for his comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicole, and to the more than 500 participants that I see still on the, on the line participating today, uh, thank you for spending some of your time with this really incredible collection of subject matter experts and leaders. Uh, I certainly, to me, feels like almost a, a conference worth uh, information delivered just in a, a, about 90 minutes here. Uh, so appreciate the continuing themes about thinking about overcoming barriers to, to language access that we've heard, the emphasis on building trust, uh, the idea of having a plan, rehearsing that plan, practicing that plan, um, all important principles here. At FEMA, our mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by convening and by bringing groups together to share information. And so hopefully uh, you've benefited uh, at least a little bit from uh, that convening, this convening today put together by our team. Uh, and I want to thank all of our panelists and speakers for uh, really just thoughtful uh, and valuable real-world information uh, regarding this really important topic. So as we as we close out, I uh, want to, uh, in addition to thanking our speakers, uh, provide a, a prompt for uh, the next edition of our voice partner call, uh, which is going to be focused on partnerships and hazard mitigation. Uh, that's tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, March 13th. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, if you're looking to engage with FEMA's voluntary agency liaisons, uh, there are a number of ways that you can do that uh, through our voice dashboard. Uh, through our snapshot product that shares information on a regular basis about disaster response and recovery uh, operations across the country. Uh, that includes links to our library of resources, uh, the email address at which you can reach our voluntary agency liaison team, uh, as well as the map of our FEMA staff who serve as liais liaisons, the voluntary, ag voluntary agencies, faith-based organizations, and other non-governmental organizations across the country. Uh, so, Nicole, to you and your team at the DHS Center, uh, thank you for the collaboration, the opportunity to, to host the session here today, uh, and we wish everyone a safe afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this brings the program to conclusion. Thank you for joining us today. So long.